If it's true then as Shakespeare said, there are more things in heaven than we can imagine, then it might be justified to ask whether in the skies of the other planets of the solar system, celestial phenomena could occur quite different from those we are accustomed to observe on our planet. Different colors, speeds, masses, shapes and volumes. Environments mostly hostile to life, and very dark skies where large and small moons move, with nights that last months or a few hours, or where the sun can suddenly reverse its apparent motion. In this journey, we will try to put together science and imagination, visiting skies completely alien to our daily earthly experiences. Our tour obviously starts from Mercury, the smallest and closest planet to the Sun. Although Mercury has a very thin atmosphere, from its surface a hypothetical Earth explorer would see the stars even during the day. In a black sky dominated by a solar disk up to three times the size observable from Earth. But these are details that our hypothetical traveler could appreciate only having a really resistant equipment. First of all, an adequate protection for eyes and skin since the proximity of the sun and the lack of the atmosphere would make the bombardment of ultraviolet rays simply lethal, and then a bomb-proof thermal insulation, since on the small planet there are temperature changes of more than 600 degrees centigrade, with absolute minimums of minus 70 degrees and maximums of plus 430 degrees. The only chance to escape the heat even during the daytime period is to reach the poles, where the sun rays arrive oblique and create twilight regions at more human temperatures. Solve these small practical problems, our visitor could enjoy a very unusual spectacle. Even a very slow in its development, that is, the sun rises in the east and advances very slowly in the sky, about three times slower than the sidereal motion of the stars, increasing more and more the apparent diameter near the meridian, south direction. The motion slows down until it stops completely. Then the sun produces a double inversion and resumes the path to dive towards the horizon, which will reach 88 days later returning to its original size. But what is special about Mercury to make such a strangeness possible? Only two things, a very elliptical orbit and the sun practically two steps away. In practice, the strong gravitational attraction exerted by the sun has blocked the rotation of Mercury on its axis in a resonance ratio of 3 to 2, with the revolution motion. In time, that is, in which the planet makes three complete turns on the same. It also travels two whole orbits around the Sun. This ratio between rotation and orbit period based on small integers, called resonance, affects the duration of the Mercurian day, making it very different from the Earth day. Here on Earth, the sidereal day, that is the time our planet takes to make an entire turn on itself, to the fixed stars is 23 hours, 56 minutes and 4 seconds, and is almost equal to the solar day, which is the time of rotation to the sun of about 24 hours. Both are much shorter than the Earth's year, which lasts 365 days and a few hours. On Mercury, however, because of the rotation in resonance with the orbit, the sidereal day lasts just under 59 Earth days, equal to two-thirds of the year which is about 88 days, and the solar day, that is the time that the Sun takes to go back on the same meridian of Mercury, lasts 176 Earth days, two Mercurian years. It is this long interval that to an inhabitant of the planet would appear as the real day. The consequence of this is that the apparent motion of the Sun in the sky of Mercury is affected much more than in the terrestrial skies by the completion between the rotation motion of the planet and that of revolution. The first makes the sun move, as on Earth, from east to west. The second, on the contrary, makes it move from west to east. In general, even on Mercury, it is the motion of rotation that prevails, so for most of the Mercurian day, the sun proceeds normally in the sky from east to west. However, when it approaches the perihelion, due to the proximity to the sun and the high orbital eccentricity, the planet obeying Kepler's second law, that of equal areas and equal times, gradually increases its speed, reaching 56.6 km per second, a real sprint compared to 38.7 km per second of the orbital speed at the aphelion, and this acceleration causes the orbital speed of Mercury to reach and exceed for a short period 
of a few Earth days the speed of rotation. Here then, magically, the Sun appears to get stuck in the sky and slowly come back, is the apparent motion from west to east due to revolution, which momentarily prevails over the apparent motion from east to west due to rotation. Another oddity of the Mercurian sky is the slow movement of the Terminator line. On Earth, the line between day and night moves at a very high speed, about 1,670 km per hour at the equator, and it is obviously impossible to follow its movement on foot. But on Mercury, everything is different. As we have already seen, the solar day is very long, 176 terrestrial days, and the planet has a circumference that is a little more than a third of the terrestrial one, 15,331 km. As a result, the Terminator moves on average only 3.6 km every hour, so that even an old Mercury visitor could walk at that speed and keep the Sun always at the same height on the horizon. As far as stars and constellations are concerned, there is obviously no difference with what we can see from our planet, apart from the very slow motion with which they cross the sky. For planets instead, there are differences, at least for the closest ones. Venus, for example, from Mercury can be observed in opposition to the Sun. Compared to Mercury, is in fact an external planet, and contrary to what happens for us on Earth, can go in opposition and show itself with its fully illuminated disk. This allows it to appear to Mercurians 16 times brighter than we Earthlings are used to see it. Be sure to join the Insane Curiosity channel. Click on the bell, you will help us to make products of even higher quality. But the best show you can see in the sky of Mercury is surely the vision of the Earth accompanied by the Moon. Our planet seen from Mercury appears brighter than Venus seen from Earth, and the Moon shines almost as bright as Sirius. The two points of light are separated by a variable angular distance, which reaches up to a maximum of 16 arches, practically half the angular diameter of the Moon disk seen from the Earth, a true celestial jewel and the only example of a natural satellite visible to the naked eye from the surface of another planet. Let us now move on to Venus, whose surface is probably the most inhospitable place in the entire solar system. If an earthly visitor found himself suddenly catapulted there without protection, in a few moments he would end up roasted, crushed like an omelette and asphyxiated. Responsible for this horrible end would be the Venusian atmosphere, an infernal fume hood composed of 96% carbon dioxide and the rest of molecular nitrogen plus traces of other elements and compounds. This very dense blanket exerts a ground pressure of 95 atmospheres, equivalent to that experienced on Earth at a depth of one kilometer under the sea. In addition, carbon dioxide, which dominates everything, is responsible for a gigantic greenhouse effect, which makes Venus the hottest planet in the solar system a natural furnace with a ground temperature of about 470 degrees Celsius, higher even than that of Mercury, despite its shorter distance from the Sun. Let's imagine then that our hypothetical space explorer landed on Venus, protected by a kind of indestructible bathyscape, able to withstand pressures similar to oceanic ones and temperatures able to melt lead and zinc. What sky would this fearless traveler see? Nothing unfortunately memorable. In fact, the planet is perpetually wrapped in an impenetrable shroud of clouds, formed by three superimposed layers located between 50 and 70 kilometers of altitude, within which a rain of sulfuric acid is produced, which due to atmospheric pressure and heat ends up vaporized before reaching the ground. Clouds everywhere, perennial clouds that prevent your eyes from reaching the stars. If ever there were living beings on Venus, they were certainly not astronomers. All of the astronomy to be done from the surface of Venus could be limited to the observation of the Sun's disk, in one of the rare moments in which it is able to leak from the thick blanket of clouds. But that of atmospheric opacity is not the only obstacle that would prevent a Venusian astronomer from doing his job. There is in fact also to consider that because of its enormous density, equal to one-tenth of the water, the atmosphere of Venus behaves as a super-refractive medium. In practice, on Venus, a ray of light is so curved that it makes the complete circle of the planet. The observer would thus have the impression of being at the bottom of a basin and would see as in an immerse mirage the entire surface of the planet extending all around, repeating itself in concentric rings until infinity. 
This effect, theorized by many specialists, has never been confirmed by the photos of the Soviet landers of the Venus program and is therefore still very controversial. The cloud layer is in continuous and whirling motion. Very powerful winds at high altitude, which blow up to 360 kilometers per hour, make the cloud cover make a complete tour of the planet from east to west in just four days on Earth. This is really strange if we consider that the rotation motion of Venus is very slow and contributes very little to shake the atmosphere. A Venusian day lasts in fact 243 Earth days and is longer than the Venusian year, which is 224.7 Earth days. The cloud cover does not prevent light from filtering through the ground, where visibility is quite good and winds are very weak. As the images sent by the Soviet probes have shown, the panorama that can be observed from the surface of Venus is surrounded by a yellow-white light, which allows to see the landscape from a distance. Another oddity of Venus, the rotation around its axis is retrograde compared to that of all the other planets. If we were there, we would see the solar disk suffocated by the haze rising slowly in the west and setting in the east after about four months. The moon's sky can instead be considered alien in a manner of speaking. We have been up there and we know what we can see or not see immersed in that magnificent desolation. The sky is black, of course, since there is no atmosphere to spread the light. And apart from the slowness of rotation, so the sun and stars take about 14 days to rise and set, the rest is all as seen from Earth. Only one thing changes, the incredible view of our planet, practically motionless in the sky of the hemisphere that looks from our side. Its angular diameter, which due to the eccentricity of the lunar orbit, varies between 1.8 and 2 degrees, is four times that of the moon seen from Earth. And this together with its higher reflectivity of the surface causes the Earth fully illuminated by the sun to shine in the lunar sky more than 50 times more intensely than the full moon in the terrestrial skies. The Earth seen from the moon also shows phases similar to those of the moon, but reversed. When we see the new moon, from the moon we see the full Earth, and vice versa. And the same thing happens for eclipses. The eclipses of the sun seen from the moon are nothing else, in fact, than the eclipses of the moon seen from the Earth. Because of the greater angular diameter of the Earth, such eclipses bring a much wider and deeper darkness than those we observe on our planet. The darkness caused by the Earth's interposition can last up to six hours, barely illuminated by a pale reddish light produced by the sun's rays filtered through the Earth's atmosphere. But the most striking feature of the entire lunar sky, we have already mentioned it, is the fact that for an observer placed in the near hemisphere, the Earth would appear motionless in the sky without ever rising or setting. This happens because of the lunar libration, a complex oscillatory motion due to the eccentricity of the lunar orbit, which is traveled with variable speed in contrast to the rotation motion, which has constant speed. The result of the oscillation is that the Earth does not appear motionless in the sky of the Moon, but describes a sort of oval with a diameter of 18 degrees. If the orbit of the Moon was perfectly circular, then the Earth would appear in the lunar sky always at the same point, more or less high on the horizon depending on the position of the observer. We are just at the beginning of our journey. In the next video, we will visit the pinkish skies of Mars and the busy skies of Jupiter. Look it up on the Insane Curiosity channel.